to everyone. So I think we can we can start this uh, uh, session of the European Distance Learning Week uh, organized by Eden. Today we have uh, a session uh, on future perspectives in open root, the quality and assessment dimension. This uh, uh, session is uh, uh, offered uh, in uh, the framework of uh, um, the EDEN NET uh, network uh, of academics and professionals that uh, uh, I hope you all know, but that uh, uh, if you don't, you will join very, very soon. Uh, within the network uh, uh, of academics and professionals, which I chair, we try to use social media channels to improve interaction of professionals. We support professional development. We offer different kinds of webinars on themes of shared interest, and we try to listen uh, to members, uh, members' ideas, and we try to uh, support new groups, new research, um, networks. Uh, but this was just to uh, introduce our our session today um, and to tell you that uh, um, besides me uh, from as I, as I, uh, I told you I chair the network for academics and professional steering committee uh, I come from the University of Roma uh, Tre. Uh, and so from uh, from Italy. Uh, here you have uh, uh, the list of uh, speakers uh, uh, today. Uh, first of all, Eva Ossianinson, Eden Executive Committee member, Eden Sigantel Group Chair, uh, Eden Fellow, ICD OER Advocacy Committee Chair, and ICD uh, Ambassador for the Global Advocacy of OER. Ulf Daniel Ehlers, from the Baden-Württemberg Cooperative State University, uh, as well Eden Executive Committee member and Eden Fellow, uh, Dr. Don Ockert, uh, Jr., Global Consultant, Eden NAP SC member. In fact, Don is a very active member in the steering committee uh, from the NAP, Eden Council of Fellows Vice Chair. Francesca Mendui, PhD student, University of Roma 3, Eden NAP member, and at the moment uh, developing a uh, period as a, a PhD uh, visiting uh, scholar at Princeton ETF. Uh, so she's connecting from, from the US. Uh, I uh, will just give you some brief instructions for this session. Each presenter, each speaker has about nine, ten minutes for each presentation. You can write down comments in the chat area and questions as well. Um, microphones will not be activated to, for participants. And the webinar will be, of course, recorded and accessible at the Eden website afterwards. Uh, I don't want to, to steal time to our uh, speakers today, so I, I, I just leave you here some, some information regarding myself, so if you want to contact me, uh, you have all the details here, and I uh, leave the floor immediately to Abba Ossianelson and her presentation on future perspective on open route. Thank you, Abba, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, Antonella, for your introduction and for the presentation of me as well. And thanks for the invitation being here today. Uh, can I have, um, let me see. Yes, I, I got my slides. <clears throat> Oops. They went away. <laughs> so, 
So yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so the topic for this um, uh, session webinar today is about future perspective in open um, open routes, the quality and assessment dimension, and um, especially uh, as you have seen for the brief introduction for this webinar, it is uh, mainly focusing on OER, open education resources, and I have also chosen to uh, primarily uh, talk about that. The slides are coming and going. What is happening? Um, so yes, I'm a professor in um, innovation and open online learning, and um, uh, as I'm especially talking about uh, OER today, I will. Uh, also said to you that I am leading the ICD OER Advocacy Committee, and the, the reason why I've chosen to talk about OER today is because we very soon will have the um, UNESCO, United Nations OER recommendations coming out. Uh, but first of all, um, although I have chosen to um, especially focus on that, I will um, strongly argue that um, for the quality agenda for open online learning, there are strong demands and needs to redefine the quality agenda. Um, because there are so many things uh, rapidly changing in our field, so we can't uh, any longer talk about quality as we did just some years ago or even last year. Um, so there's a huge need and um, uh, uh, urgent um, um, activities and um, missions to redefine the quality agenda uh, in that way to take more the learner's perspective, for example, to look more at, at impact on the individual level, uh, at institutional level, um, uh, also for the, the impact education has for society, for citizenships, etc. And also uh, such areas as, um, as uh, satisfaction and engagement. And, and the impact for the individuals, as I said. Uh, so I uh, have chosen to not speak so much about uh, that today, as many of you have heard me talk about that also before, and that is really <laughs> in, in my heart. Uh, so yeah, we're just saying that, that um, then I will continue with um, more focusing on OER. And first saying that um, I'm also sharing the Eden Special Interest Group on Technology Enabled Learning, TEL, and Quality Enhancement, and of course OER is uh, involved in the, that topic. And we have had this uh, special interest group for some years by now. We are uh, um, working both, both internally, but also to externally. Um, internally, I mean with the Eden and Eden members, and uh, together with Eden NAP. And some webinars we are organizing together, um, as uh, this one, for example. And also we will have uh, two upcoming in the spring. We have a special page at the, the Eden um, web page where you can find more information. We are some 10 people in the core group. Uh, Ulf Daniel, uh, Ulf Daniel Lenas, who is here today as well. He is also in our core group as well as Antonella as a member. Um, <clears throat> so externally, we're also trying to uh, have a voice with a quality agenda as such, where it is appropriate. Uh, for example, with the OER recommendations is one of, of the issues. Um, focusing on OER, uh, you may know that the uh, UNESCO definition was uh, redefined uh, at the UNESCO meeting in Paris in May, and um, read like this. There are some small changes, as you may notice. Learning, teaching, and research material in any format and medium that resides in the public domain or are under the copyright that has been released under an open license that permits uh, no-cost no access, reuse, repurpose, adaptation, adaptation and uh, redistribution by others. Um, together with this uh, uh, redefinition, there was also a redefinition for Creative Commons, which you maybe have seen, also slightly uh, modified. 
Uh, the work on, OER, on the forthcoming OER recommendations are, of course, uh, based on the Cape Town uh, Open Education Declaration, the 10th anniversary. And more precisely, um, that means that uh, talking about OER is not that, that we're talking about just the, the resources, the materials as such, but also the whole area of openness and open practice and open culture. And the Cape Town Declaration um, also talk about uh, communication uh, open, uh, empowering the next generation, uh, <coughs> uh, thinking outside the institution, data and analytics, how that are used, beyond the textbooks. Quite often many people, uh, and even among our community, when they are thinking about and um, talking about OER, they are mainly thinking about open textbooks. So you see the, it's a much wider area. And I think that's very, very important to strengthen that. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this today. Uh, connecting with uh, other open movements, like open access, for example, open education, just to mention something. Uh, the open education for development, uh, open pedagogy is a huge area. Um, and if we really would like to take away our uh, beyond the textbooks, there are strong needs to, to go for open pedagogy. Um, and that has been a very uh, common concept also nowadays. I think you have heard about it many times before. Uh, opening up um, um, public funded resources and, uh, of course, the, the copyright uh, reform for education. And then maybe there are some X card as well, which are not so explicit. So you see, uh, it is a, uh, you need to see this ecosystem where OER is just one part. And also to reach the SDG goals number four, it is said that uh, the use of open education and OER uh, is the only way to reach the, the SDG for education for by 2030. <sighs> I don't know what's happened with the slides. Sorry for this. I'll try to. Yeah. Yeah. I will say um, I say yes that um, for those recommendations, uh, there are five um, main recommendations, and that is about building the capacity of stakeholders to find, reuse, create, and share OER, develop supporting uh, supportive policies, ensure inclusive and equitable access to quality OER. Um, nature of the, the creation of sustainable uh, models for OER and facilitate international cooperation. So those are the five made uh, recommendations which will be taken next week. Uh, so I will then just finalize about uh, a report which was come out um, two weeks ago, I think it was, from Commonwealth of Learning about guidelines for development of open educational resource policies for you who are working in this area. So with that, I will finalize for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Heba, for, for your presentation. Uh, I really hope we will have time for for discussing um, more uh, about the, the input that you gave us with your presentation, especially on the hidden chat that we will have at six uh, later. Uh, but let me. Um, pass the floor to Wu. Uh, he is, uh, uh, as I told you, from the Ben and Wuttenberg Cooperative State University, Eden Executive Committee member and Eden Fellow. Please, Wu, the floor is yours. Uh, you as well, you know, all of us have uh, nine, ten minutes each. So, please. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I hope that you can hear me. Please let me know in the chat if that's not the case. I would like to um, uh, thank Eva very much uh, for her um, talk. 
and would like to continue uh, with a little bit, uh, well, with a little bit uh, um, a complementary topic. I would like to focus on um, the assessment dimension, actually, um, and uh, on the question, how can, in times of open resources and open learning, open pedagogies assessment look like, actually? Um, the sources which I'm presenting to you, the, um, the content, is uh, uh, some of it is taken from uh, two books which we have just uh, uh, in the last years worked on. One is called Open Learning Cultures, a Guide to Quality Evaluation and Assessment. It kind of fits to our webinar to today. <laughs> and the other one is called Changing Cultures in Higher Education. Uh, it's about uh, the culture change through technology and openness. So, first of all, when we think about assessment, um, there are lots of different assessment forms and uh, methodologies, and there are also lots of different assessment purposes. And I think it is important to uh, keep in mind this diversity of activities which we are employing and the diversity of purposes also uh, which we are using uh, to when we talk about assessment. Assessment for, for example, personal purposes could be just to see where am I as a learn learner standing uh, in my learning progression. Assessment on an institutional, <coughs> on an institutional um, uh, level uh, could be um, to have learners uh, passing certain exams so that they can enter from one uh, area of their studies into another area of their studies. Um, and uh, then, of course, also uh, there's an assessment on the institutional level where you are assessing certain and accrediting uh, certain programs. So there's a, a wealth of assessment purposes and forms, and that's important to keep in mind um, because uh, also um, assessment is uh, something we can, um, some of the assessment forms we can use better for open assessments and some of them we can um, use better for closed assessments. Um, I've tried to um, work on the issue of open educational practices. Uh, open educational practices um, is what we define as um, using technology first and secondly um, allowing students to choose in an open way their learning pathways and their learning objectives whereas we teachers we are just uh, uh, alongside them and trying to support them. So this is how we define open education practices uh, and when you think about now um, open education um, practices, how can the assess assessment look like um, and how would it look in closed environments? Closed environments are environments uh, where teachers are determining the learning pathways and teachers are determining um, uh, the objectives of learning. Uh, maybe also where little technology, little uh, open educational resources uh, and little open education is used. So when you try to group the assessment forms, you can see that uh, for open education practices, um, assessment which um, gives the um, autonomy uh, of judgment and the activity in the hands of the learner very much. So, for example, formative assessments of own learning, the assessment for learning, uh, which means you're using the
So I think there's a problem with uh, the connection. Reboot. I don't know if, uh, yes, I, I see everyone is typing uh, on the problem. Um, we will try to understand if we can can restart his connection. Otherwise, I don't see any reaction. <laughs> but of course, this might happen. Mm -hmm. The mm, as you can see, all the presentations are uh, focusing on the topic from different points of views, and this is uh, is uh, really useful to have uh, a wide picture of the subject we are trying to uh, to address uh, today. Um, yes, also the video is not working anymore. I don't know if it's trying to connect again. I think so. Now I see it is there. Okay. Yep, I'm you back. Are. There was. So, very, so sorry, sorry about that. I'm just uh, continuing. So this is um, just a list of different assessment activities, and you can see which ones are more suited for open and more more suited for closed. And then when you think about what are we actually assessing when we are in open uh, environments, you can see that these are also different objects of and activities we are looking at. The focus is different, actually. The focus of um, of open assessments in open environments uh, is much more on on the uh, participation process, for example. Yeah, we are looking much more at how do ac actually learners interact, how do they participate in the learning, uh, how do they uh, maybe create artifacts. Okay, so um, uh, we are looking at learner created content. We are trying to understand the personal learning environment learning learners uh, have uh, been building around them. Uh, and the quality uh, is often not assessed through teachers um, or through experts, through the lens of an external, uh, let's say, elevated expert, but it is rather um, assessed uh, through peers. Um, all in all, what is becoming more and more popular is actually um, to see that whereas um, in the traditional assessment uh, philosophies, um, we are separating learning process and assessment, whereas the assessment takes some kind of uh, evaluation or um, a proof uh, of of, of learning a uh, step in the end of the learning process, and um, whereas in open learning environments, um, the assessment uh, is um, often not often not automatically, but can be embedded actually in form of peer interactions and form form of self evaluation, formative assessments um, throughout the learning process as an embedded activity which is informing the autonomous learner about the learning progress. If we only look at the question which kind of um, assessment methodologies are, the, the, are, are suitable, are suited, are actually carrying this kind of characteristics, that they are formative, that they are embedded into the learning process, um, we can see that um, these, all these different uh, assessment uh, methodologies are suitable for that. Um, that means that there is a wealth of assessment methodologies actually out there. Uh, for example, self-evaluation, which is, uh, if you look at it uh, from the original con concept, it is a very elaborated concept, a very elaborated methodology where learners are creating in cooperation with teachers a criteria and then apply these criteria to their own learning and then try to derive from that uh, development aspects for their own learning uh, and then share that with the other learners and the teachers. 
um, self-assessment, responsive evaluation, formative evaluation, I mentioned them already, but also all these social and community participatory assessment forms like peer review, peer reflection, peer assist also, where you are together solving problems and assisting yourself uh, in your own learning problems, where you form a learning group. Uh, peer learning, bench learning, where you try to uh, understand um, um, how is my own learning ability compared to the learning ability of another learner of my group. These are all requiring, of course, uh, very, very high reflection levels of uh, your your own learning, of the, of the learning uh, of, of, of learners, uh, and are therefore something which is suitable for learners who have a high uh, autonomy. When we now think also, that's my coming to the end, my, my last slides, think about uh, the future, where in the future, uh, soft skills, a new kind of skills, we call them future skills, will be much more important, where autonomous learning, self-responsible learning will be uh, a much more important uh, step. Um, then, uh, in open learning environments, open learning assessment forms will gain uh, a lot of relevance. And not only that, uh, we have created uh, scenarios in this research. Uh, I show you the report again, which you can freely download at nextskills.org, which talks about the next 10, 15 years of higher education development uh, and the future skills in this. Uh, and in this report, you find also four scenarios. And here you can see also that open assessment can also, or has also, an additional component, which is uh, the component of micro-certification, of certifying small bits and pieces of learning in a way that they are um, documented in an understandable and evidence-based way. So that in universities in the future, where we, how you can see here, um, students will uh, follow not just a study path in one university, but they will follow a study path in several universities as lifelong learners in a very personalized way. Um, this will also be an important aspect of, uh, of uh, assessment leading to small bits and pieces uh, certification so that an autonomous learning biography uh, can be, uh, in a way, uh, generated and uh, taken uh, by the learner with themselves so that uh, it really forms part of their own um, of their own learning uh, biography. So that's from my side. Thank you very much. And um, I pass back to Antonella. Break uh, of connection. Uh... The different presentations today really uh, fits one with with the other in composing a, a wide picture of uh, uh, the focus we are carrying out. So thank you so much. I uh, uh, wrote down some notes and I wish there would be the time to, to discuss some of the issues you proposed. But as I said, uh, on the Eden chat, we will have time also to uh, remind uh, and to recall different instances that were that came out of our uh, presentation. I again, I don't want to steal time to the next uh, uh, speaker, uh, and so I um, uh, pass the floor to Don August, Level Consultant, Eden NAP SC member, Eden Council of Fellows, Vice Chair. Thank you, Don, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, thanks, Eva, and thanks, Olf, and thanks, Antonella, for your uh, interesting and insightful comments. Uh, as Olf said, he was going to bring a complimentary view to our topic today, and I'm, I'm hoping to do the same. I want to talk a little bit about all these great resources and ideas we have. How do you make it happen? How do you make it happen in your institution? What I'm going to talk a little bit about today is leadership, 
how to navigate the culture in which we work, and how do you manage change. Now, we all bring a variety of experiences um, around the issues of quality uh, to our work. Um, and these are four that, that stand out to me that have sort of struck me over the course of my career. Language matters, how we define quality and the context in which that quality operates often is really important in terms of our conversations and our discussions. Um, I don't know about you, but I oftentimes I found I was talking at cross purposes with my colleagues about what we understood to be quality. And I think this leads into the second one. Where one stands on quality is influenced by where one sits. I can assure you, if you ask your vice chancellor or president, or you ask your dean of engineering, or you ask your department chair of music, if you ask a student, an employer, an alumni member, a member of the board of trustees, they are all gonna be representative of the major stakeholder groups to make up your university. And hence, they're gonna bring some different viewpoints uh, about what constitutes quality. Um, the gatekeeper of quality is the institution. I wanna first and foremost say, the oversight agencies and accrediting groups play a, play a marvelous role in helping us as institutions stay focused on those quality issues, particularly in an era of open and distance learning where we have new processes, procedures, and methodologies that are new to the accrediting group as well. But my experience over the years is at the end of the day, it's up to the institution to really take the responsibility for ensuring quality uh, in all its guises. So the last thing I want to say on this in this particular area is quality and open content must be core values of the institutional culture. We've made incredible progress in OERs over the last 10 years, but I would also say we haven't made as much progress as we hoped we would. And I think part of the reason for that, that the adoption rate hasn't been as fast as maybe many of us would have hoped for, is we have not been able to embed it into what are the core values and uh, uh, the central culture of the institution. Now, when we talk about quality, what do we mean? Again, this is, this is my slant and perspective only. You bring your own to this. I only share these as an opportunity for you to reflect on what it means to you, okay? Do we normally associate rigor and high expectations with qualities? Yeah, I think we tend to do that. Um, that doesn't mean by having rigor and qualifications, or excuse me, the rigor and the high expectations will necessarily result in an outcome that's useful. Ulf was talking about soft skills. I can teach students rigorous and have high expectations, but when they walk into the door to their employers, they didn't learn the right skills. So even though we had rigor, we had high expectations, we taught them the wrong things. Review. Uh, this one is really important for OERs and for setting quality standards for open educational resources. We must engage the faculty as an essential stakeholder in that review process. We are doing that to some extent. I think we need to make a greater effort to do that. Relevance, yes, quality is tied to relevance. Again, back to what is real world skills and knowledge that our students should be learning. Some areas of quality or what we define as quality can actually be linked to responsiveness. When we think about student services for open and distance learning, the time of the response, the type of service, the agility to respond to student and faculty needs, all ties in with responsiveness, okay? And finally, renewal. This is the one that is, I find to be actually quite interesting. The bar changes usually when we're not paying attention. Let me give you an example. Your institution goes from 10,000 students to 50,000 students. In that process, and not because of malice, that's a good thing. It creates access. It's the mantra of open education. Open the doors to everybody. But in the process of doing that, you've now created uh, a system that is going to put a great stress on the student services of your institution. 
can you gear up fast enough and quick enough? Some of the issues that are facing and have faced open institutions that serve unbelievably high numbers is it's a catch up game all the way. They're trying to get those services back in a place so that they can serve that many students. Okay. So, even though we think of renewal or setting the bar as typically going up, sometimes, even though not our intention, our efforts, our decisions are somewhat flawed. And in fact, we reduce the bar, we reduce the level of quality. Many of you know Professor Rory McCrell from Athabasca. Rory and I go back way too long. I'm not going to tell you our age, but nonetheless, a long time. And I always like to ask Rory very direct questions because I can always be confident he's going to give me the most direct answer on the planet. He doesn't pull any punches. He says things exactly what he means. Here's what he had to say when I asked him about quality related to open educational resources. I've highlighted what I think to be some of the interesting aspects of his response. He would suggest that the licensing agreements, Creative Commons, that we have with OERs need to be pushed more. He believes that the advantages of those licenses is not fully understood. Remember, I'm sharing what he said. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing necessarily. Okay. Um, sort of what I said earlier, depending on where, where you stand, on quality is often influenced by where you sit. Quality assessments is quality for one does not mean quality for all. But he also goes on to say what we were talking about earlier and what I mentioned was, on the other hand, a good measure is that if a number of qualified academics attest or vet the quality and or respected institutions, then that could be a good indicator as you can get. Um, I like this because it links a little bit to a lot of the work that EBA and Eb or Ulf have also done around benchmarking. In other words, comparisons with other uh, institutions and other units on what constitutes quality uh, in OERs. Now, everybody needs a good cartoon, and I love this one. Uh, can you read what it says? It says, for a fair selection, uh, everyone's going to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Okay? <clears throat> now, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is talking about students, and I, I remind this, and I remind uh, myself uh, and you that every time I teach, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me that I cannot individualize instruction, teaching, and learning and assessment for every one of my students. I wish I could. I wish I was able to do that, but I don't have the time, the money, or the resources to support that kind of endeavor. You can take this uh, picture, by the way, and it could be faculty, it could be any of your stakeholder groups, okay? Um, and uh, incidentally, a little humor goes a long ways too with the challenging work that we, that we all have. So where are we in 2020? If you look back over the last 20 years, this is where I think we are. You may agree, you may disagree. Overall, in the last 20 years, I think the overall quality of online, face-to-face, -face, and any other ODL instruction, video-based audio conferencing, has improved. I think our faculties play a greater role in the various aspects of online, just as they do with, and what we want them to do with open educational resources. And finally, I think one of the really interesting outcomes, though we do need more data to support this, is that distance teaching and face-to-face -face teaching now are mutually reinforcing. That means they inform and support each other. They make each other better. And I think that's pretty cool. I've had faculty members say to me, I'm a better classroom teacher today because of my expertise and my, my experience teaching at a distance. To sum up, and lastly, what kinds of things over the next 10 years, maybe at the institutional level, might come to the forefront? They may be there right now, and, they, and a couple of these are. One of the things, and one of the, an article I read recently, I thought was very insightful, and it has to do with the 
the concept of our adjunct faculties becoming a quality indicator for the, end of, for the institution over the next decade. Institutions have moved to using more adjuncts on an average at least 50%. In some sectors, as much as 80% of the teaching staff are adjunct faculty. The other feedback we have about it is our institutions don't necessarily have a good rewards, incentives, and treat these adjunct faculty very well. Will this become a quality indicator that institutions will have to pay more attention to? I don't know. The quality and scope of student services, this again goes back, particularly in instances where you have accelerated growth. Can you keep pace? Will that become even increasingly more important over the next decade? And I think tied into skills development, aligned with what uh, Wolf had to say earlier, the number of student graduates is an imaginary key performance indicator. The real indicator is how many graduates you have that can get jobs. Um, presidents love to talk about how many people they have graduating. They don't ever tell you that a good majority of them can't find work. So I think we're going to see that continue to be a valuable indicator. Uh, that's the end of my comments. Again, um, I think that my only concluding comment would be good ideas, good innovations get pushed aside every day. Not because they're not good innovations, not because they don't have great potential, but because we don't know how to introduce them, manage them, lead them, navigate them, and manage change with them within our organizations. I encourage you to spend as much time on that and that process as you move forward. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Don. Again, very inspiring uh, presentation. I have lots of notes here. I don't know if there will be the time to discuss, but anyway, uh, we, we start uh, uh, and we collect ideas, as you said, as you prompted us to do, and we will keep on uh, talking about that. Thank you so much. So now uh, we welcome. have uh, uh, Francesca Amenduni uh, directly from uh, ETS. Princeton, and again, uh, Francesca's uh, uh, presentation is related to um, a, a project and to uh, some results of a, of a project, of a, an international European project uh, devoted to the assessment of quality in an open virtual mobility MOOC. So in this case, we will have uh, a, a, um, an empirical instance of what uh, the group uh, tried to do within the subject we are uh, trying to focus on today. So, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to present empirical results of this um, deep theoretical, theoretical background. I wanted to ask uh, to all the participants to write also what is your connection with uh, open, uh, open education and uh, quality, and uh, uh, we, are, we, will, uh, we will be happy to read your answers after the presentation. Uh, today I would like to show you some preliminary results uh, of our pilot phase. Uh, in which we are trying to assess the quality of a mo mm, uh, virtual uh, mobility uh, MOOC, Massive Open Online course. Uh, the MOOC is composed by open educational resources as well. Uh, the project Open Virtual Mobility Erasmus Plus uh, was uh, funded by the European Erasmus Plus uh, program. Uh, the main idea is to promote uh, virtual mobility in European higher education. I don't know if you are familiar with the concept of virtual mobility, but virtual mobility is a concept complementary to uh, physical mobility. The idea is that people that cannot access to physical mobility for uh, economic reasons or for other kinds of uh, uh, problems could uh, more easily uh, uh, access to uh, virtual uh, mobility. The project is uh, uh, 
organized in seven intellectual outputs and a university of the group of university of Roma 3 coordinated by Antonella Poce is responsible for the output six that concerns open educational resources massive open online course and a pilot phase the, the, the aim of the pilot phase is to assess the quality of the uh, of the virtual mobility MOOC. Uh, the pilot phase uh, uh, is aimed not only to assess the MOOC but all, all the features that uh, are uh, that compose the MOOC in particular uh, a matching tool and a group formation uh, e-assessment that are uh, quizzes, e-portfolio and peer assessment, gamification and badges, and learning material and uh, course structures organized in, form in, uh, in forms of open educational resources. Uh, the um, uh, theoretical principles of our pilot phase are uh, design-based research and uh, the add the model proposed in the quality framework of the project in the output seven and the pilot was organized in three phases the first one uh, we carry out the first phase uh, first pre-pilot phase between december and january 2019 and the results of the pre-pilot phase were presented at the last eden conference in a poster uh, we are now carrying out the, uh, the first pilot phase cycle between uh, September and December 2019, and we will carry out the second pilot phase cycle between January and May 2020. In order to assess the quality of the MOOC, uh, we uh, designed a questionnaire that is organized mainly in six sections. The first section is uh, uh, concerns personal details, uh, such as age, gender, affiliation, and role. The second section regard, uh, regards general questions on uh, the MOOC. The third section is about badges and gamification. The fourth section is about uh, technical aspects of the platform. The fifth section regards the questions specific to the uh, three levels of each MOOC. Uh, the, each MOOC is organized in three levels of difficulties, foundation, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, uh, today I will not present these uh, results because, as I said, we are, uh, our pilot phase is uh, uh, in progress, so we will present the results for the four, fourth um, initial sections of the questionnaire. For the section um, from one to six, uh, participants are, re are required to express the level of agreement with the statements regarding the MOOC on a Likert scale from uh, one strongly disagree to five totally agree. Uh, at the moment, the MOOC uh, uh, most uh, um, with, with uh, most uh, participants was uh, the active self-regulated learning MOOC with uh, 47 six participants. The second mini MOOC most attended was media and digital literacy MOOC with 23 and 6 percent of participants, followed by intercultural skills, open-mindedness, open education and virtual mobility, networked learning, autonomy driven learning and collaborative learning. Um, these uh, uh, mini MOOCs uh, were designed according to the uh, skills necess necessary to be involved in a virtual mobility experiences and uh, these skills were identified in the output one of the project. If you are interested to know more about it, you can find all the information on the website of the project. Um, these uh, results uh, uh, were uh, calculated one week ago uh, when uh, we had uh, 250 participants, but I have just checked and we uh, uh, have arrived to uh, 353 participants. So fortunately, the number of participants is growing and growing. The average year uh, is 24 years. and. Uh, at the moment, uh, participants uh, uh, to the MOOC are mainly uh, students, university students, and a small percentage are teachers. Um, despite most of the participants come from a partner university, 
uh, we have also a uh, small par uh, participation from uh, external institutions. So this is a positive result. The, the MOOC uh, is uh, uh, followed also by external uh, institutions to the partnership. Um, the, the level most uh, uh, assessed uh, was the foundation level with a 95% of answers. Uh, intermediate and advanced level were assessed less compared to the foundation level. And this may be because uh, for intermediate and advanced level, it is necessary uh, to um, activate tutoring because there are activities such as uh, uh, group formation and peer assessment that need to be configured manually by tutors. Uh, on the other hand, foundation level could be uh, followed by, uh, without tutoring. Uh, regarding technical aspects of the MOOC, we see that participants express uh, general positive evaluation. In particular, the length of the video was considered good, the sound of the video was clear, and the technological environment is considered friendly and usable. Uh, a less positive agreement regards uh, the two statements. Uh, MOOC layout positively affects my learning experience, and the system is easy to use. Uh, with other age lower than 3.65, but still higher than 3. So uh, it's uh, uh, still uh, not negative. Uh, regarding uh, 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 statements uh, uh, concerning the MOOC, participants tend to disagree with the negative statements regarding the MOOC that you find at the uh, bottom of this uh, picture. So, for example, the negative uh, statements were the amount, the amount of knowledge to acquire is too much high, and participants were not uh, di disagree with these statements mainly. And some information was, was taken for granted and not well, uh, well explained. Also, in this case, participants tend to disagree. On the other hand, on the other hand uh, participants uh, tend to agree with the positive statements regarding the MOOC. In particular, participants uh, appreciate the use of different kinds of content. OER. So in this way, we uh, had also an indir indirect information regarding the quality of open educational resources. And uh, regarding uh, badges and gamification, participants express a general positive evaluation, in particular toward the badge uh, design. Uh, the next phases are, uh, since the sample will be enough consistent, more than 350 participants, we are going to carry out more elaborated statistical analysis, not only descriptive uh, analysis, after the end of the pilot uh, uh, cycle in December. For example, we will try to answer to this research question. Are there, uh, are there any statistical differences among scores for each MOOC? Are there a, uh, any statistical differences among scores within a MOOC for each level? Uh, we will collect feedback to implement the MOOC before uh, the second pilot uh, phase. And we will use this data to, imp to implement the quality of the MOOC. And we will collect the data after the end of the second pilot uh, cycle. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we, we, uh, we will uh, compare uh, the answers from the first uh, cycle to the answer from the second cycle in order to see whether the quality perceived by participants is uh, improved. Uh, thank you for, the attention, uh, for your attention. Um, please, uh, if you want, visit our learning hub. And uh, if you want, you can um, uh, subscribe to one of our MOOCs. As I said, the foundation level can be followed without tutoring. But if you want to follow intermediate and advanced level, please write us and we will, uh, we will uh, implement everything in order to allow you to follow the other MOOCs. And uh, uh, you can write uh, to me and to Antonella Pocha in order to uh, ask information regarding the pilot phase, if you want to, be, uh, to provide feedback uh, or uh, uh, if you want more information about it. Thank you again for your attention.
Yes? What? I, I didn't I didn't listen. Sorry, my mic was off. No, no. Uh, so thank you so much for your for your presentation, for the summary and the details of the data uh, you presented. So an example of how uh, we could uh, uh, interpret uh, quality uh, assessment and because of course we are we are unfortunately we are running out of time uh, i would like to ask each of of you starting from abba or don I, I mean the the order that we followed just one question the same question to all of you and i i um, i get uh, the 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 input from don's uh, presentation uh, he said that uh, whatever uh, stakeholder we could uh, we could um, meet and ask uh, them what do you think uh, quality is, we would get different uh, different perspectives, different interpretations. So, uh, to each of you, starting from Abba, can you define quality in Open Root, which is your your favorite interpretation ever well um, the simple and easy answer is uh, quality is in the eye of the beholder uh, then we all know that uh, quality is a very complex uh, phenomenon and as I said in the beginning of my speech as well we really need to redefine the quality agenda because there are so many um, other kind of aspects, issues, uh, dimensions to take into account in uh, the digital area which we are in right now. Like more uh, about uh, satisfaction, engagement, uh, impact uh, for all the stakeholders. I see, I see. So this is the short answer. Yeah, 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 the, the, the main concept. And what about you, Hulk? Um, I think that uh, research is, uh, when we look at the papers published, then we can see that um, the locus of control of quality in open and personalized learning environment is shifting towards the individual learner very, very much. And um, uh, that is interesting, and that is uh, also a challenge, uh, because uh, in such cases we have less and less external objective standards. However, when learning is individualizing more and more, it is of course um, uh, clear that the learner is much more in the driver's seat. And that is the challenge for institutions to define open method of quality development and of assessment. Uh, and that is how my uh, presentation is fitting in there, uh, because it is challenging still today for institutions to adopt these kind of open assessment methodologies. Thank you, thank you all uh, for your comment and Don, I know you already talked about that, that interpretation, but we want to have uh, I guess I'd make two comments, and I have, you know, I have to agree with Eva. You know, the the best answer is not the one that says it depends, but the reality is, is that sometimes that is the answer. I guess what I would say is quality with a little Q and quality with a large Q. And I think at the minim, minimum, um, it's a minimum level of performance as defined by the creators of the knowledge and the users of the knowledge. Now that could be a skill, it could be a soft skill, a hard skill, um, it doesn't matter. Um, but I think we're talking about some minimum level of performance. Now, people who promote competency-based education will tell you that, too. 
Um, but I think at the very minimum, it has to be something like that. Just a footnote to that. Do you know that in 40 years in this profession, I've never heard one person, not one person, say that the standard of face-to-face -face classroom instruction was a good measure of quality. And that's what open and distance learning has had to live up to for the last 40 years. We were placed at a disadvantage. Um, I once had a president say to me, you have to make sure that the quality of teaching in distance mode is commensurate with what is going on in the regular classroom on our campus. And I said, Mr. President, if you knew what was going on in the regular classroom on our campus, you probably wouldn't say that. So I guess, you know, again, once again, uh, the culture in which you work and the norms of that culture play a great role in determining our flexibility in setting those standards. So I'll stop there. If I, sorry that I had a problem with my mic again. I don't know why. But anyway, thank you, Don. It was very uh, effective. Your your comments were very effective. And the last word is to Francesca. Uh, I agree what was uh, what the other uh, speakers said before, and I want only to add one thing: uh, data, data, and data. We need to integrate data from different sources, and I think that the learning analytics will uh, help uh, so much uh, in this uh, in this context, to, in the context of quality assessment. Thank you, Francesca. In fact, the idea of using those data in a critical way uh, in order to improve uh, uh, the system, the offer, uh, the teaching and learning dimension we are all engaged in is actually uh, the key word. So I thank you all for the very inspiring uh, webinar we carried out today. We will keep on discussing uh, on Twitter at 6, uh, so don't miss our uh, tweet chat at 6, where we will try to summarize what we have been saying during uh, the webinar. As I said at the beginning, this uh, webinar is recorded as all the others uh, uh, offered within the European Distance Learning Week, but also all the others that we offer as the NAP, Network of Academics and Professionals. So um, don't miss our offer. Go to our website, disseminate uh, uh, our work, and we'll be in touch on Twitter in a while. Thank you all for being with us.